Howdy folks, Sega Sonic fan here. Today I want to talk a little bit about something I've been working on. A rap about a phenomena of video interference that happens when using composite video, usually called uh, rainbow artifacting or cross-color artifacting. And it's a problem I've been trying to fix for a very long time. And this is a super gun allows you to play arcade motherboards, you know, at home. An old project I've been updating with a fix for this. Now, turn this on, you get your voltage readout, and I'm going to show you what it looks like when it's bad, and then what it looks like when it's fixed. And my guess is those of you that have worked on uh, composite video circuits before, uh, we'll probably be familiar with what I'm talking about, especially if you've worked on a super gun before. So this pot right here is an adjustable capacitor. It's not actually a pot, technically, since pot is short for potentiometer, and that's not what it is. It's a trim capacitor. Anyway, this is what rainbow banding looks like, and you'll see kind of the rainbow the rainbowish stuff. I don't know how to describe it. On the edges of everything. It's particularly bad with uh, black and white checkerboarding, which is what a lot of early consoles did if they couldn't do proper transparencies. And so, yeah, if you look really close here, you'll see it. Hmm, my camera's not loving the uh, PS1 LCD here. But yeah, you can you can see it there. It's It's pretty nasty. So that'll happen if you hook up a TTL can oscillator or even a regular parallel resonant crystal to a chroma encoder um, without some very specific things. And when I turn this trim cap here, notice that it changes. And if I turn it just right, I can actually get it to be removed 100% from what it looks like. I'm, this is a pretty small screen, but if you look at that now, I don't see maybe a very tiny bit in the motorcycle there. Very tiny bit. But it looks really clean. About as clean as you'll get with any console, which was really my goal to begin with. Now, once you get it towards this clean, you can actually clean it up even more with a Luma Trap. Notice that you'll get a little bit of it when the characters are walking across the screen. And that has to do with the rainbow banding still being along the edge of some of the, some of the stuff that, uh, some of the artwork, some of the pixel art. And you can further clean it up by using a Luma Trap, which some circuits have. Go ahead and turn this off. And uh, a Luma Trap is a inductor, resistor, and capacitor circuit that is put onto the luminance signal to filter out color in the luminance signal. Now, there's some great data sheets on this. I specifically highly recommend, if you want to read about Luma Traps, to read the AD725 data sheet uh, from Analog Semiconductor, or is it Intersil? one of those companies that make that chip and that will give you some great I mean it really educated me about how Luma traps work and it's fantastic knowledge and that's probably the next thing I'm going to add to this super gun uh, since I use the 8724 which doesn't have a Luma trap because um, it's really the best one for getting that cross color artifacting down to a bare minimum now why is that 8724, 8725 only have one actual difference. They're both chroma encoders used for taking RGB signals and turning them into composite, for those that aren't familiar with them. They're very common in super guns because they're a recent, more recently manufactured than, say, the CXA 1645s, which are used in a lot of old game consoles. Before that, it was the CXA, 6, CXA 1145. And after that, the last one that Sony made was the CXA2075. Those are all chroma encoders used in the Sega Genesis. Uh, the Sega Saturn used them as well. 
Now what I'm going to show you here though is the 8724, which is, uh, it's newer and it's nice because it doesn't require any serial data to communicate to it. Um, and it's, it's a purely an analog chip. Now it's buried under some wires here. I've got this whole thing kind of crazily built to a very, uh, very small footprint here because I kind of had to to make this really tiny super gun or to fit everything in here. And so this is your 8724. This right here is what's called a parallel resonant crystal and it's a 3.59 I believe megahertz crystal. And that crystal is sends the timing pulses to this chip and the frequency uh, to produce what's called color burst which gives color to a composite video signal for NTSC. Uh, for PAL, you just use a different frequency crystal. Now, it seems simple enough, right? You get the right crystal, it's the right frequency, you hook it up, and voila, you get your video, you get it in color, it shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, well, the problem is, is that every crystal has, and I, I learned this only recently, every, every crystal has to have uh, a capacitor across the output uh, which is what these two wires are. They're going to that trim capacitor I showed earlier uh, to match what's called the. Uh, gosh, I'm trying. I'm forgetting it now. The load capacitance, the load capacitance of the chip itself, which is capacitance across the terminals that you're connecting it to, and that extra capacitance, in uh, which will be in parallel with a crystal when you hook it up, makes the frequency change ever so slightly. That in combination with possible bleed through into the Luma signal uh, creates your problem. Now it's interesting because the Luma signal, which accounts for your black and white image uh, synced up, um, uses, uses frequencies that are in that color range, that 3.59 megahertz. And so that's where the Luma trap comes in where you can filter out by building what's called, I believe, a, a band gap filter, um, which you basically use an inductor, a resistor, and a capacitor to make a gap in that frequency so that your Luma signal comes out without any color information whatsoever. It makes absolutely sure it doesn't get mixed in when it's combined to make composite. And the downside is you get a decreased resolution um, because it uses part of that frequency for the resolution of the image. Now that's a, that's a Luma trap. Now let's see how did I fix the issue with the cross color artifacting. I've tried three ways with this chip, and it's only the third way that actually worked, which I think is really interesting. So this chip has a pin. Uh, what is this pin? Nine, ten. That's the pin twelve. Pin twelve. So not this big silver bar here, but the one directly to the right of it that you can barely see. There's a 10k resistor right here going to uh, positive five volts. Now pin 12 determines how you're going to use um, the crystal oscillator, what kind of oscillator you're going to use. If pin 12 is grounded, then you can just input a 3.57 uh, megahertz crystal for NTSC, and it will, you can just, this is called a parallel resonant crystal, and it doesn't produce the complete pulse, so there's an oscillator inside. Um, really, it's an inverter, a couple inverters, one used for buffering and one used for 180-degree uh, phase um, for the crystal itself and some other parts. Um, but it will use an internal, internal oscillator to finish off the crystal, so you can use a minimum part count and produce the proper color frequency. The problem with this is that when I was doing that, while it seemed like a wonderful um, space saver, I would get uh, huge problems when changing this trim capacitor that I showed earlier with the screwdriver, um, basically changing the load capacitance because for whatever reason that would just cause interference within the chip itself. Um, and even though I could get rid of cross-color artifacting to a degree, it would introduce all sorts of other interference and I would actually lose spots of color on the screen uh, through vertical stripes, which was very interesting. And I, my guess was correct. My guess was is that was due to the internal oscillator. And I was proven correct because the next thing I did was way number two is I used a TTL CAN oscillator. 
And these are interesting because you just give them five volts, you give them ground, and they output the full um, 3.579545, it's even printed on here, uh, megahertz frequency um, in TTL pulses like the chip needs without any other additional circuitry. And so I've been using these for years, these little, these little tin cans here, uh, because it's the lowest part count, unless you have an on-chip oscillator. It's, it's the lowest part count. And I always thought, well, that was the best I could do, because it matches the spec and everything else. It's the most uh, stable frequency, and it's the exact frequency. It's even printed on there. So I was like, how, what am I doing wrong? And I couldn't figure that out for a very long time. And this was only until very recently that I realized that the load capacitance of the chip itself alters the incoming frequency. Very interesting stuff, I think. And so the best method, it turns out, that I just showed you that actually fixes the cross-color artifacting is by using a fully external parallel resonant crystal with uh, an inverter, a 74HC04 inverting chip. Now this is a huge, uh, it's not really a space saver, right? It's, it's about the biggest you can go, having an additional circuit and an additional crystal to produce effectively the same frequency that you're trying to recreate with these other methods. But by doing it with, with this circuit, you don't have the interference of the internal oscillator, which is basically this 7404. Oops, a little bit of my heat resistant tape getting in the way there. Uh, I was just using that as an insulator. Uh, but you, you have this chip is essentially built in here, along with a couple other SMD parts you can't see here. There's a few capacitors, a couple resistors. And by doing it this way, you don't have the interference of that chip uh, interfering with other things that this chip is trying to process, the 7404. And you can also tweak it very, very specifically to match the load capacitance. Um, and you also just overall probably have less interference if you can you know, ground it effectively. You do have to ground the inputs as well, the unused inputs. But um, there's a schematic for this, this setup that I just used uh, on the 8724 uh, datasheet. I used the exact schematic that it shows for building a, a crystal oscillator. Uh, it's funny that the, the data sheet itself says you should build this because then you can reuse the clock frequency with the buffer for other circuits in your design, but that's not the real reason. I mean, not for me anyway. I think, I think they should really say that you should do this if you want uh, the best results with your cross-color artifacting. So big success for me. I know this seems very esoteric, but I'm, I'm super stoked because I have never gotten good composite video out of arcade boards ever, or anything really, building, building my own chroma encoder um, without doing this method. So for all you hackers out there using an 8724, um, you can also, I don't know if you can do this, you, you, I think you can do this with an 8725. It has a 4FSC input only, so when I was talking about pin 12 being grounded or connected to 5 volts, this pin... Uh, this is the only one that has the option of switching that between 4FSC and FSC, uh, FSC being short for frequency sequence counter, which is determining the frequency of the input. It actually takes the 3.579 and multiplies it by 4, uh, It's um, the frequency to do some other things within the chip. But this one you can do it, you can... Uh, you have that option, whereas the other one you'd have to use like a 14 megahertz crystal and then it, it would divide it by four uh, for the 8725. Now I don't know if that works effectively with the load capacitance to um, give you the proper color burst because you might be changing the frequency ever so slightly um, when it's before it's being divided. And I have a feeling that you might actually get less results that way, but I could be wrong um, because the it's the three point 579 frequency that's the most sensitive. Uh, so I'd rather have that be correct and then have whatever's slightly off multiplied by 4 for the sync timing or uh, the other things that it's doing with that. Anyway, very exciting stuff for those that are making super guns. And, and for me, uh, just as something I've tried to figure out for, for years actually, when I was in college I was originally working on this, this issue. And so my next project for this thing, um, this crazy mass of Super gun. If you look inside here, there's a bunch of craziness. That chip right there is a voltmeter, which I built before uh, voltmeters were like really cheap. Now you can get one for three bucks. Uh, but I built that one from scratch, which was kind of satisfying. 
Uh, there's also, if anyone's interested, there's a RGB amplifier right there, um, which takes the AC RGB input, turns it to DC for my purposes, and then also back into AC with the help of some capacitors into the 8724. And it kind of DC clamps it. It also functions as a low pass filter to remove you know, higher frequencies, again, to try to just make that, make sure that band, that 3.579, is really clean as possible. Uh, the other thing that's in here is an ISL 59885 sink cleaner circuit. I still have to add the uh, XOR gate to um, to actually combine the H and V into C-Sync. Um, I, some people don't realize, I didn't realize, that the C-Sync output on this is not actually affected by the circuitry internally. Uh, it just removes chrominance and color information. Uh, from a composite signal, but it doesn't actually fix it, so to speak. Um, and so yeah, my next, my very last thing is I want to add an MAX7443. The 7444 is actually a little bit better, but the MAX7443 is a S-Video uh, Chroma and Luma 2 composite um, converter chip. Uh, it's got some low-pass frequency type stuff as well, which is kind of nice. But ultimately, I have to have that chip because I need a buffer stage if I'm going to do the Luma amp because I'm going to be cutting out frequencies from the Luma channel, and I don't want to have those cutout frequencies go to my S-Video jack right here. So I'm going to use that chip to buffer it. So I have two outputs, one which is Luma trap filtered and one which is not, and then it'll combine the signal into a really clean composite once again. Uh, and I'll be able to have another cap on the outside of this thing to adjust the Luma trap as well. What that means is that any arcade board I plug into this thing, I will be able to tweak the hell out of it till I get perfect composite video. And by tweak the hell, I mean turn a couple knobs. Um, and while I, uh, yeah, you know, it's cool stuff, I think, for me anyway, being a diehard arcade fan and wanting uh, the best video quality possible. So this is what you do when you're really into video quality. Crazy hacks like this. But um, once this super gun's finished, it's going to be pretty sweet. I'm also going to add... Uh, there's there's uh, This guy right here, is the, these are auto fire uh, circuits that I built a long time ago that I designed that are 555 based. And I'm going to add some MUXs to switch those more effectively than this stupid switch which broke over the years. I built this 10 years ago, if you can believe that. Um, and I'm just revamping it right now. So anyway, cross-color artifacting mystery solved. You can use this with all your game consoles. Uh, anything that you want to upgrade the chroma encoder or tweak. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So uh, happy hacking, everyone. And uh, thanks for checking out this video and being interested in these weird hacks that I do. This is Sega Sonic Fan, signing out.